Hello YouTube friends, welcome back to another video on my channel. So in today's video, we're going to be doing a deep dive into LateNode and what it is. So essentially, LateNode is an API automation tool. Uh, a lot of you guys have requested to do a video on this one and do a comparison between LateNode and ActiPaces. So this is what this video is going to be about. Uh, we're going to be doing an automation here, quite simple one. We're going to build this uh, intelligent task organizer automation. I really don't have an idea what I want to name this automation is because it's quite simple, but I asked the AI to name uh, what this automation is going to be. But essentially you're going to have content, whether it's coming from speech to note, it's an app that allows you to speak to an app and then it's going to transcribe and send the text up and use the AI to translate it or summarize it. There's also another app called WizWrite, which we're also going to be using and then also the content or idea could also be coming from a table, which looks like the one we have below. So once the content gets through the automation, the AI is going to be analyzing the content and it's going to be classifying that content based on these three categories, journal, to do and calendar. So if it finds that the content is a journal, it's going to be creating a record in Notion. And if it finds that it's a to-do item, we're going to be adding that record in seven to-dos. You see here, this is my account in seven to-dos. And if the automation is classified as a calendar, the AI is going to be analyzing that content. It's going to be grabbing the specific date and time, and it's going to be extracting that from the content. So it is added inside of a Google Calendar, which I've set up here. So I'm going to be doing a demonstration on how it works. But let's take a look at the speech note, which is a data sheet inside of a table. I have an idea, which is a single uh, line text. So I can add the idea straight to my a table. The date add is going to be added. And also the captured is going to be missing in the beginning. But once the AI has processed and analyzed it, it's going to be set to captured. But in the beginning, it's going to be default to none. And also I've added here a select field type, which uh, has three options. The first one is to do and then calendar the journal. So the, the automation is going to be processing this idea and it's going to be adding to this table. So whether it's coming from this table or it's coming from WizWrite or speech note, it's going to be added to this table. It's going to be set to captured and it's going to be classified as whatever the item is, whether it's a journal or a calendar. And then that uh, content is going to be added to whatever that classified content is going to be. So let's demonstrate this by using these two ideas that we have here. So I have a birthday party on August 3rd at 3 p.m. in 2024. So I'm testing it in two different ways. One is I'm being explicit as what time and the year that I want to create this event. And the second one would be Christmas. So I'm very, being very big here by just saying that it's going to be an appointment in Christmas. So I want to see if I can actually classify this and figure out the content or the, the event date for this type of idea. So let's run the automation. The automation looks like this, which feeds from all these different sources. It gets analyzed by AI and then gets added to this specific buckets of where I want to place those information. So let's take a look at the um, automation inside of late node. So here's what the automation is going to look like. I built this automation to showcase some of the, the features that late node specifically offers, such as multi node trigger. So you can see here that I have multiple triggers. I have one trigger as a schedule. So it pulls the data from a table. It's going to do a repeat. This one you're using the iterator. There's also the second trigger here, which also goes to the same scenario, which is coming from WizWrite. So I added a webhook specifically for WebWrite. I can rename this to whatever I want, but I specifically renamed this as WizWrite. And then I have a webhook for speech to note. So I named this as speech to note. And then I have another trigger here. If I just want to run this and test out the AI and how it handles different scenarios, I created a different trigger on run once here. So I can trigger on demand if I want to. I'm going to tell you guys how to set this up in a speech to note. It's quite easy. So if you go to speech to note here, you can go to settings and go to webhook. And I can create multiple service names here and then specify the speech to note. So this matches the speech to note webhook. So that's that for speech to note. And then I can go to any of these notes that I have. So let's say I pick this one. I can go and click on this and send this to a webhook and pick the webhook that I have here which I only have late note at this point. 
So that's how you set it up in speech to note. We're going to come back to this one. Let's go to WizWrite real quick and I'll show you how to set this up. So when you're in WizWrite, you can just have to go to webhooks and then set up the webhooks. So in WizWrite, it's a little bit different because when you create a note, it's going to be automatically sent. So you don't have to manually send the note, like speech to note. So WizWrite automatically just feeds the content into the webhook automatically. So that's automatically done for you. So I've created a couple of testing scenarios here. Let's take a look at the journal. So when it determines this is a journal, it's going to create a new page with the journal information. It's going to summarize the content and it's going to be adding the date and the, the title, which is going to capture the essence of what the content is about. And it's going to shove all that summary inside of that page. The second type is going to be introduce. So if it determines that it's a to do item, it's going to create multiple to do items inside of the seven to do's. So this could be a to do list or whatever to do item that you have. So you can swap this out with whatever to do app that you use. And lastly, um, if it classify that content as an event, it's going to be adding that event inside of the calendar. The automation can also determine the event uh, date and time if the year is not specified, if you're not being explicit about it. But if you specify a year of 2025, it's going to create the event next year instead of this year. It's going to be smart enough to handle the different scenario. Let's start off by looking at these two different ideas that I created here. I created an idea here where I specified that I have a birthday party on August 3rd at 3 p.m. in 2024. So I'm being explicit about the date on when this event is going to occur. You can see the captured is not set yet because this is brand new. Once the automation has ran and captured this event, it's going to set this capture to true and it's going to classify it into these three different categories, either to do calendar or journal. So I'm going to set it. And then the next one is vague. Uh, I'm really not specifying the year. I'm not specifying the time. All I'm specifying here is I have an appointment on Christmas. So hopefully it can determine that this Christmas is going to be happening this year as opposed to next year or whatever. So let's go back to our automation and run through this, right? So I'm going to run this scenario. So this is going to run the automation for trigger on ones. So anything that has a trigger on ones is going to be triggered. This one picked up the trigger and ones from the upper side and it's going to be processing the records inside of a table. So let's go back to a table. So you can see the two items has been captured. It's been set by the check mark. This has been classified as these two items for the calendar. So let's go into Google Calendar and check it out. So the first one is August 3rd at 3 p.m. So you can see here, I added a birthday party because I only specified birthday party. I didn't really mention the name of the person that's having a birthday party. It would also include that. The next one is a dentist appointment on Christmas. So let's go to December Christmas. You see here that it added a dentist appointment on Christmas. So it just added it as a whole day event, but it specified here as a Christmas. So that's that for the AI table automation. Let's try out the speech to note. So the speech note here, I have a journal type of idea here. So at the current state in a table, I currently have two ideas here. So I'm going to send this journal into the webhook and I'm going to be sending up the transcript and then uh, we're going to be specifying the late note and I'm going to be switching from form data into JSON and let's go ahead and share, share this note. So let's go back to a table. The idea has been captured automatically and then the date added and then captured and this was classified as a journal so that means that if you go to notion here that there's already a page that's been created inside of this page within this journal so you can see here there's a date and there's also the title that's been analyzed so this is a title summary based on the content that i've provided in my journal so this is what the journal is about so it created a title and then the date since i didn't provide a date it just says that it's wednesday and then the main events, I, then, I attended this, I learned practice headlock, and then worked on wizard positions, and then it has some personal reflections. So I have some pretty cool AI prompt that I'm using for this one. So I'm gonna be showing you guys in a little bit what it looks like. So this is the prompt and this is what the output of that prompt and it created basically a summary of that event of the journal. All right, so let's test out wizard, right? 
So with Wizrite, it's a little bit different. So I have to actually speak to the microphone and this is automatically going to be sent up uh, to the webhook. So I'm going to test out the to do or the list item feature, which we're going to be sending items into seven to do's. So right now we don't have anything in our to do items. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to be speaking to Wizrite and I'm going to be sending a to do so hopefully I can analyze it. So let's go to this audio and then speak. So I'm going to be attending my friend's potluck and I will need to bring three boxes of pepperoni pizza, two packs of root beer and three bottles of wine. And that's about it. And then let's go back to a table. So I added the idea here, it captured it. And right now it's going through the AI. So it classified it as a to do. Let's go to seven to do's. And in a little bit, the seven to do's, to do's should be added into the to do items here. So I've specified three boxes of pepperoni pizza, two packs of root beer, three bottles of wine. And I believe that's it. But it added a prepare items for friends spot luck as a to do item. So I also, if you notice here, this due in eight days. So I've added a, a due date here. I've added a seven days from today's date. So it looks like it's in eight days. So I might have to figure out some calculation issue there. But you see here that it's due in eight days. You can, I think you can add some description here as well if you want to. But the title is there. Get three bottles of wine, uh, purchase two packs of root beer, and get three boxes of pepperoni pizza. So that's pretty much how it works. So let's take a look at what Late Node is. So Late Node is an all-in-one low-code platform. So it's marketed towards uh, low-code developers. So if you want to use a uh, code in your automation, Late Node might be a great option for you. So I'm going to highlight the different features and do a comparison between Late Node and Active Pieces in this video. We're going to look at what makes Late Node unique. We're going to do a walkthrough of the platform so you can see and have a better understanding of where everything is when you first get started with Late Node if you want to try it out. Along the way, we're going to be looking into shared templates, where authorization lives, the difference between variables and global variables. We're also going to be looking into nodes inside of scenarios. So you need nodes, which basically constitutes the different things that you need to create a scenario. And we're also going to be looking into like a custom nodes we're going to be looking into some samples demos so you can see the power and the capabilities of late note and what it can do so i figured i would do show some demos in this video and lastly i'm going to be showing you guys how to build this intelligent task organizer automation so this is what the ai has come up with as far as what this automation is about so we're just going to go and roll with this one so like i previously mentioned we're going to do a comparison between late node and, and active pieces all right let's, let's take a look at the board here of, of the difference between late node and active pieces and make that i'm just gonna just tell you guys the features that i think is more prominent and i believe what makes late node a great alternative compared to active pieces so late node uh, as for starters uh includes a headless browser uh, which means that if you're used to something like zero work, uh, zero work includes uh, some automation tool where it can control the browser and, and can do some automation. Uh, it can also do some headless, they call it headless. And then there's a headful browser, which if you see the browser pop up and do some automation on the screen, that means you're using a headful browser type of automation. Headless browser means that there's no UI. Pretty much everything just happens in the background. So you also have this option inside of zero work. So this is available in late node. This is something that's not available inside of active pieces, nor it's in make.com. So it's a plus for that type of scenario because now it allows you to do a bunch of different things such as web scraping. So you don't have to rely on external tools to do your web scraping or any of your uh, browser types of automation testing. If you're doing health checks, I have a development team. If you're doing some regression testing, it's going to be beneficial for that type of scenario. You can also take some screenshots because Puppeteer, the node library that Late Node is using, has some screenshot features, which allows you to take screenshots of any website. In addition to that, it also has a JavaScript code feature similar to ActivePieces, where you can write some custom JavaScript code. So 
is similar to Act what Active Pieces provides. They just have different ways of implementation. The only thing that's different between Latenode and the Active Pieces is that the JS code feature in Latenode has an AI copilot built in, which I'm going to be demonstrating in a little bit how it looks like. Another thing that Latenode has that make.com or active pieces doesn't provide is the multiple triggers. Like I've shown you guys in the demo earlier, you can have multiple webhook triggers with different URL for the same scenario, or you can have a schedule trigger or a different app within the same scenario. So you don't have to create multiple scenarios to accommodate different types of trigger just to handle the same type of scenario. This saves you some time without having to hop around and go to different scenarios and bounce around between different ones, even though you're running the same automation. So that's a great feature that Latenode has. Another thing is how they operate uh, in terms of how they process on automation. So they have a a more cost-effective way of uh, running your automation. So if you have 100 steps within your flow, it counts as 100 steps. So in terms of late node, uh, you can process the same steps similar to active pieces, and it's gonna only going to cost you one credit. So every 30 seconds of ed execution, regardless of how many steps is involved in that automation flow, is only going to count as one credit. So in, in a way, it's more cost-effective that way since it's based on the time of processing versus how many steps is required to run your automation. There's some other operators as well, some functions that's just already available in make.com. Active pieces doesn't have some of these operators and function. We're not gonna go through these functions today. We're probably gonna be doing another separate video on this one since there's quite a bit of things to cover in one video. Another one that I really like about Latenode is it has this built-in webhook tester. So if you notice that I use Postman in my videos, so I go in back and forth between Postman and Active Pieces when I do my automation, just to test out and send a request to the webhook. In Latenode, you don't have to do that anymore. So everything is baked in as part of the platform. So you can stay in Latenode and you don't have to go anywhere else. So you can test out your webhook. You can build your payload and your queries and send the request right there and then in, inside of that scenario. Before we proceed and get into the late node platform, I just want to point out that all the, uh, the templates and resources that I've created uh, and all the templates that I'm going to be uh, creating in the future is going to be available inside my Lean Code AI automation in school, uh, where I post all resources and templates. I also post some exclusive tutorials as well for active pieces for zero work and also i'm going to be adding late node and rubber motion in the future as well please free to check it out and join if you can let me know if you have any questions so i hope to see you there so let's log into late node when we, we first log in into late node you can see here that uh, you're going to be given this interface where you're going to be seeing all the different scenarios that you have in the account so you can see that you can create your scenarios uh, on the top left and you can also start from a template. If you want to create your, your scenario based on an existing template, you can do that as well. Uh, let's check out the templates here by going to the share templates, or you can go here and start with a template, which is going to take you to the same place. So there's different templates here that you can access and start off with. You can see here that there's basic templates that you can use. There are some examples here on how to use it to connect to a MySQL database using JavaScript. There's some templates here for using Axios, for creating a screenshot of a web page, text translation. There's also some headlo headless browser stuff where you can scrape uh, Yahoo search, uh, parse page titles. So let's say if you want to do some SEO optimization, you can also do some uh, operation templates where you can create some HTML forms and send it back as a form to the client. So you can treat it as a web service where you can render and send back an HTML instead of a JSON. So you can also use this sales template. So you have some samples here. There's some templates from Daniel and Ryan here. From, uh, if you want to do some Telegram type of automation, Daniel has some scrape uh, data from Google Maps, which is actually pretty cool. I'm going to be showing you guys in a little bit how to how to run that so just kind of see the power of this automation tool so let's check out the template right here so when you go to a template you can preview what the template looks like you can add a note you can see here that there's a note here with instructions on how to get started with this automation so how to set this up so you can see the flows and the different steps that's in this automation so, right, so you can clone this in your in the environment and set this up. So you need a, a Google Sheet for this and also a SERP API account. 
So you can see that all the different stuff uh, that's been set up for this type of automation. So let's go back to the, the scenarios here. This authorization, this is where you set up your authorization. You can create a new one from here. If you want to be able to access an environment uh, variable from anywhere in your scenario, you can create a variable or key here and store it that way so it can be uh, encrypted. So since late node doesn't have a, a Straco in implementation yet, uh, I went ahead and added my Straco key here, which is encrypted so I can reuse that in one of my nodes. So I'm going to be showing you guys all that. But for now, this is where the authorization lives. And then take a look at the global variable. You see here that I can create some global variables here. But there's two types of variables. There's global variables and also there's local variables, which local variables are only available within a flow. The global variables, on the other hand, is only is available across all the different scenarios. So you can, you can store here uh, the variables if you want to share variables between different scenarios. I can edit it or I can delete it. Uh, you can even specify the type of uh, vari variables if you want to store a string or integer. Uh, you can also store a boolean or a JSON string. So you can set the value here. And you can also programmatically set the global variable within the actual scenario inside of code. So there's multiple ways of being able to set uh, variables and global variables. But let's take a look at the scenario here. So you can see here that I can create some folders and structure my scenarios in various ways. So if you want to organize it based on certain features, so I have multiple folders here. I've cr even created a custom node here. So I have a Straco image, which I created so I can reuse this across the different uh, scenarios that I have since they don't have an integration with Straco yet. And Straco just released the Straco uh, image API. So I figured I would do a custom nodule for this. So a nodule includes an input and an output. So an input is where you can take in a parameter and from here you can customize it and you can add SVG icons. I added a prompt as an input so I can feed this into the HTTP request. So the prompt would describe the actual image. So I can add a description here and I can add a default value if for some reason I didn't specify that. I can also mark this as required so that this prompt has to be included when I called this Straco image. This is a pretty simple custom node. So I'm just calling this API endpoint from Straco and I'm just making a HTTP post request where I'm specifying the model and the description is coming from the input right here in the beginning. And then you're also gonna be specifying the landscape. I can also specify the size as an input parameter, but I just decided to hard code it in this case. And also there were variations. So how many images I want to generate right now, I'm just hard coding this. The only thing that's really dynamic here is the description because I want the prompt to be coming from an external source. From here, I'm adding the authorization and the bearer and then the key is coming from the authorization. So I'm just an encrypted authorization token, which I added and then I'm specifying it as an authorization as part of the headers and then the content type of application slash JSON. So that's gonna be it. And when this HTTP request comes back from Straco, we're gonna be getting the result, which then we're gonna be sending back in this form. The body includes the data and then the images, which we're gonna be just sending the array of images. So if, if we are requesting for two images, this is gonna send back an array of two uh, URLs for those images. So that's how the custom node is. And also when you're creating a nodule or custom node, uh, you also have to change the scenario type. You can see here up the top left. So instead of a scenario, you have to sw uh, flip to a nodule here and then save it. So that's what the custom node is or nodule, that's how they call it. So you can reuse this across all the different scenarios that you have. So you don't have to worry about re-implementing this call over and over again if you want to create some images for a platform that's not supported within a late node. So that's an alternative there. So let's run through one of the examples that they have, which is striping Google Google Maps. So this the two worksheets here, one is to add the URL and one is to scrape data, which includes the title, phone, website, and all that information. There's some Google Maps uh, URL here, which goes and searches for different types of businesses. So that's gonna be scraped. And each time that bro, gets scraped it's going to mark this as status so right now one of them has been changed to a check mark so we're going to clear this out and we're just going to switch this back to enrich so what it's going to do is as this process each records it's going to change this one to a check mark and it's going to be sending the results in this separate worksheet here 
So let's take a look at how that looks like. So let's go into this first one. Actually, it's not this one. Let's go to the, I believe it's in the web scraping, this one right here. So I already modified this to, to use my own Google Sheet. You have to make sure that you clone the worksheet in the example. And then you have to change some values here. SERP API to use your own key. And this is going to process each row. You have an iterator here, which does the processing and adds a single row to the separate worksheet. So let's run this one and run it once. And this is going to trigger uh, this scenario once and it's going to go through it. So you can see here that uh, the automation is already running. Uh, it's using SERP API to do the enrichment and include additional uh, information pertaining to that business. So it's still running and it's generating the, the data for this one. I'm going to have to stop it at some point once it's passed into the first record. So you can see here the status has been changed. We, we can stop the automation so we don't have to consume all that SERP API credits. So you can see the possibilities of what this, this tool is capable of. You can do your web scraping and data enrichment through this one platform. But let's get into the actual automation of how I set up the automation so you can see how it works. So I've shown you guys how I set up the A table in the beginning. So we're not going to go through that again. But so let's go back to late note here. So once your scenario has loaded, you can see here I put a instruction here of all the different resources that's being used in this demo. The cool thing about the canvas that they have here where you can create your automation is you can actually just add a node anywhere that you want. I can just copy and create this exact scenario without having to modify the existing one just to showcase and show you how everything works. So I can add a node here. Let's say I want to do a triggers and go and go switch to a trigger uh, tab here and I can go switch on schedule so I can have uh, multiple uh, types uh, working on the same scenario. Obviously, I'm not going to be having all these diff multiple scenarios here, but just for demonstration, as I have the flexibility to do so. In this case, I can create a schedule here. I can run this based on whatever type of schedule I want, or you can modify this cron expression. So depending on how you want to do your scheduling. Alternatively, you can also add uh, multiple nodes. So we're going to be doing this as if we're creating everything from scratch, but just pay attention to what I'm doing here on, on the top. So essentially, we're going to be copying uh, the same automation that we have on the bottom. So now I currently have one, auto, uh, one trigger here, which is a daily. And then uh, what we're doing here is we're pulling in the get records from a table. So let, I'm dragging in a node here. I can either click on this one and add a new node and look for uh, a table. And then from here, I can do a get records, which I can then specify. I can choose this access token that I already have available here. So if you don't have the access token yet, uh, you can create a new authorization here. Since I already have it, I'm just going to pick the existing one. And then that's going to plug in that access, uh, that access token uh, in the connection. And then I can pick the space and the data sheet. The data sheet is called LN speech to note. So you can only specify the page size and page number. But let's just run this. We're just going to grab everything. So this is going to grab all records. So this is going to run it similar to make. You're going to see this green indicator here where you can click on it, where you can see the output and also the logs if there's any. But you can see here the result, how many records are available. There's four records, which matches the amount of records within speech to note. So I'm going to uncheck the captured so we can reprocess this again. So I can show you as an example. So I'm going to deselect this. So now I have two records with no captured. So I'm going to rerun this. So run this node once. Since there's no filter in this node, I'm just going to grab all the uh, records and we're going to filter it on the next step. So I went ahead and added a, a JavaScript code. So if you want to use some JavaScript code, you're going to have to pick a code, which is under core utilities and actions. And from here, you have two options, the headless browser and the JavaScript. We're going to pick the JavaScript since that's basically essentially what we're going to be using. We're not going to be doing some web scraping or anything. So it's just going to be regular JavaScript code. And from here, I believe we're just going to grab and parse the ideas. We're doing a JSON parse on the result. And then we're going to be filtering that. So let's take a look at what we have here. So basically, we're just going to grab the result from step number six with this records array. And then we're just filtering anything that doesn't have a property of captured. So the way it works is when you query a records, anytime you don't have any set value in one of the fields, that property is not going to be returned to the client. So we're not going to get that captured 
uh, property back uh, when we make this request. So if you go back here, even though I'm getting four records, uh, you'll notice here that if I go to the fields, the captured field is not available here since it's empty. This one is the second one, which doesn't have the captured. And then this, the third one has the captured of true because it's been set and it's been set to true. Same thing as the fourth one. So what we're trying to do is we want to filter all the different records and we want to make sure that captured property exists. So we're just going to set it. So we're just copy this one right here. Right, so we want to check and grab the record from the previous request. So this one is number 44. So it's going to replace that with this one. So we're just going to expand this and we're just going to plug in the ideas right here. Let's return the ideas. So it's just to make sure that we actually have the ideas in place. Let's run this and run it once. You can see here in the logs, the ideas is no. Actually, I didn't change the number. So that should be 44. And it's going to go ahead and run this again. And that should give you the, the array of ideas that we got from AI table. So that's how we retrieve it. So now we want to use the AI capability. So we're gonna, let's switch to full screen. So you can see here that you can actually do a chat. So we want to filter out the records in the ideas that doesn't have the captured property. You have to make sure that you actually spell out it correctly. So we're going to be getting the actual property is called captured. You can see here, if you go back here, the property is captured and we want to specify that in the code when we run this. And when we talk to AI chat, let's do a prompt here. I want to remove all records within the ideas array that doesn't have the um, captured field or property. And we just hit enter. You see here that it's creating uh, a code where it's doing a check here, whether it's the captured is undefined. Let's do a replacement here, see if that works. So when, when we run this, we should only get two records, which is uh, the records that basically doesn't have the captured set for it, which is these two right here on the top. So let's execute this one right here and run it once and see what we get. So for the ideas, we should only get two and we just want to make sure that the captured is not true. So this is not correct. Let's switch to the AI assistant here, which is a co-pilot instead of the AI chat. Let's go ahead and try that out, right? So with the message above, remove records from ideas that actually I have it backwards. I want to remove anything that has a captured set. I want to remove records from the ideas that has a property of captured. And I'm just gonna hit enter. So I'm gonna to toggle the AI assistant here. I'm gonna hit enter. It's giving me the, the hint for the code. I'm gonna hit tab and it's just gonna be correct. It's gonna be checking for the property of captured and we're only gonna be filtering out all those types of records that doesn't have the captured property. So let's run this one. I have my logic wrong here. It's getting a little bit late, but let's run this and go to messages. Now I have two and just wanna make sure that Okay, I have a birthday party and now this one right here is I have a dentist appointment which matches what we're expecting. So we, we want to exclude uh, the ones that have been captured already. So that's great. So yeah, so I was able to show you uh, the, the two different types of uh, AI uh, tools that's available within the JavaScript code. One is to be able to use the chat and the second is to remove the records that has a property of captured with all without writing a single line of code. So that's great and I can get out of this. The next one is we're gonna go ahead and iterate to the different records. So we're just gonna add the iterator right here, or we're gonna pick an iterator. I marked the iterator as one of the favorites here since I use the iterator a lot. So let's bring that in. So I wanna do a loop for all the different records that's available here. But before that, I also wanna do a filter before proceeding into this next step. I wanna make sure that there's records that I need to iterate with. I don't need to do this, but let's include that as well. Let's do a full screen here. Let's switch to AI chat. I also would like to return the number of filtered ideas. So I just kind of prove the point that AI chat is actually working. All right. So 
it went ahead and added this one right here and there's some explanation at the bottom i can insert or replace i'm just going to replace it so you can see it retained uh, the existing font code and then i added this length right here and it's a pretty simple way of getting the length but i just want to show you that ai chat actually works and i'm not just making stuff up here so ideas here and the count so i can filter it out so now i can save this and now i can do a filter and set up a filter here and ensure that there's records to process i can do that and set a condition i can pick from the previous records so now i can pick from 45 we might have to run it once again since we executed it within a full screen so we have to run it again so now it gets us two so now i can get out of this i can now go to the filter again and i can get the count make sure that the count uh, is greater than zero so we're going to use one of the operators we're going to go ahead and greater than and we're going to put in the zero so let's process each of the records within that if we find anything so what i'm doing here is i'm setting a variable it's called speech to text the reason why i'm doing this is because the speech to text is set regardless of where i'm coming from so i can analyze it using a cloud 3.5 sonnet so i'm going to be using the speech a text variable which is a local variable that's only available within my scenario right so it can be either coming from this webhook or it could be coming from this trigger at once so it doesn't really matter where it's coming from i'm setting it here so that when it gets to this point i have that variable available to be consumed i'm going to be passing here the records so this takes in an array so which then we're going to be passing in the ideas here which is an, uh, an array which run this node once by the time it finished it gives you the index and then the value for each record within an array and then from here you can process it if you want to go through each record you need to add the node here on the top this is how you process each record and the one on the right hand side is after everything has been processed so i hope that makes sense so let's add a node here so we're going to set speech text let's copy the variable name here uh, i'm just going to add this one and i'm going to go a set variables uh, this is going to be a local variable and it's going to be this and then the value is going to be for each item in the array which is the idea right and we're just going to save that we're going to set the records as captured that's the next step let's go ahead a step here using a table i can and search and then we're going to update the record and then i can choose the existing token and then we're going to be capturing using this space id and we're going to be using ln speech to content and then we're going to be passing in the record id and then the idea which is already here inside of this actually we're not going to be we're going to be updating we're going to be getting the records actually we don't need to set the idea since we already have it so we're not going to be overriding the existing one all we're doing here is we're going to be setting the record as captured so that's all we're going to be setting the select we're not going to be setting this here as well we're going to have the ai determine this in the process so after that's done we're just going to set the record id and the reason why i'm setting the record id here is so i can consume that record inside here where i'm going to be using ai to determine and classify the record based on the record id and update uh, the record here i'm going to be setting the select or whatever the classification is so i'm sec i'm setting the record id inside of a variable here so i'm going to set the variable and i'm just going to do a record id here so i'm going to hit save and then we're going to analyze the content i'm just going to go copy this one right here copy paste it here so what we're doing here is i'm just going to connect this one and we're just going to feed it the speech to text so the prompt here is so we're using the cloud 3.5 sonnet and then i'm going to provide you with a piece of text and your task is to analyze the content classify it and respond with only one of the following options to do calendar or journal your classifications should be based on the nature and context of the text provided do not include any additional information or explanation in your response simply simply return one of the three options mentioned and then the text is equals to uh, the content that we need to classify the system prompt is act as a content analyst specializing in text classifications the max token is 1024 which i don't think really matters in this case when since we're only going to be sending back one of those words anyways temperature is 1.0 should be it's probably better off with zero since we don't really care about creativity but 
that's fine. In terms of being able to set the filter, you can see here there's different filters based on what type of content the content has been classified as. So just to do in journal and calendar. So let's take a look at how that works. Let's copy this as well. Just kind of speed things up a little bit here. Let's put that here. And this one is updating the record. All it does is connecting to that same one. It's setting the record ID. That's why we're setting these the variable here. And all we're doing here is we're just setting it based on the classification that we get from this step right here, which is step 50. So all we have to do is just change the data instead of this dollar sign three. We're going to remove all that and we're going to go to use 50. Oh, actually, because we haven't ran that yet. So let's run this once. And after a few seconds, you can see the result classified as to do in a type of text. So now we can use that on the next step since we haven't run it. So we can really use the, you have to actually run that one. So instead of selecting from the predefined options, we're going to switch to map as we want this to be dynamically selected. Instead of passing an array, we're going to remove that and we're just going to pass in the word text. So that's going to be dynamically being set to that. And when we run this one, hopefully it's going to set one of these to the correct select type which is, I believe it's to do. Prison an error, what else are we missing here? Do -do. Record ID, the record specified the record ID does not exist. Uh, maybe the record ID wasn't set. Let's run this one as well. Maybe because we didn't run it. Okay, that's been set to that record ID. Let's run this again. Run this node once. Sometimes it's a little bit finicky because it's running. I'm running it in, in parallel um, scenarios, so Sometimes it doesn't work because I'm setting the scenario or the the variables in two different spots. But in this case, uh, let's just uh, carry on and continue. And see here, the output is this. Let's set that for now uh, to this record ID. Let's run this. So that should just kind of get it to this step right here. So I had to select and then go back and I was going to go back and swap it out to record ID. So there's a little bit of cheating going on here just to get rolling, right? save since we're processing a to do let's take a look at how to process this to do so the way to do that is so we're going to be extracting the to do items we're going to be comma separating the different to do items within the content and that's what this this prompt is about so you just copy this one right click and copy and let's paste it and we're just going to slap it up here so the way it works is we're going to go ahead and connect this one and we're going to be adding a filter here so that we're going to be checking if this item is a to do. So this is the label for that. And the captured content, when we analyze the content from the previous step is going to be equals. We're going to be doing equality here, which is equals. And then we're going to be doing a to do. We don't have to do a quotation mark here. So you just have to specify the actual uh, to do. Also make sure that if you're doing this condition, make sure you don't have any spaces in between here as this is not gonna match properly. So make sure that there's no spaces in between here and use the operators to do inequality. Anything that passes this condition is gonna go to here. For instance, it happens to be a journal. Let's copy this one. Let's say I have a journal type of content here. Let's go ahead and take a look at this one right here. So the way to create another branch is to create, I just basically hook this up and we can add a the same one here. Let's say for this one, we're going to be doing a journal and then we're going to be setting this to journal or whatever label indicator we want this to be. And we're just going to set it to that text uh, from AI and then we're going to be doing an equality check and then this is going to be a journal. So you can repeat this across all the different types of content you have, whether it's do or blog or if you're doing some YouTube stuff, you can classify it accordingly based on that. You see here that one thing I'm also doing here as I'm creating a JavaScript code, since some of the format of being used in add to do item has to be specifically in this date format. So I just want to make sure that I can create a code here by introducing a code where it would uh, generate the code in that format. So when I execute this one, it's going to return the code in this specific format. It's grabbing today's date and it's doing a format here and it's calling this function that does the separation between a year, month, and day. Since I'm doing a, a deadline here for next week or seven days, I'm also including a next week here, which I'm doing a plus. So get date plus seven days from today. And this is why I'm getting 
seven days deadline, which also I'm setting as part of this seven to do to do item that I'm adding here. You see here, I'm adding the start date. That start date should be actually the start date should be today. And then the due date should be next week. So this is how it should be supposed to be. And then I can set the state, which is to do. Some of these things are pretty much static stuff. I'm just basically hard coding it. The title would be coming from the commissary separate value, which is being ran through the iterator. So I'm creating comma separate value here. So for instance, if I have an input of uh, this type of uh, content, it's going to go in, in comma separate those texts. So I can feed it into this iterator and do a split on it. I'm using this split uh, function here, which spits the content based on this comma. So every time it hits a comma, it's going to go in and separate that content, which in then turn the whole comma separate string into an array of string, which I can then process and iterate through it and convert it to the appropriate to do items. So each to do item is going to be added into this to do item. As far as notion, we have a summarized text to get the actual title. Your task is to capture and summarize the text, the details of the journal entry based on the content I will provide. It's going to give you this format. So which you saw earlier in the notion, it includes a title, the date it kind of gives you this breakdown of all the different things that is within that journal, the main events, some personal reflections, significant outcomes, and then I have this prompt. So feel free to pause this video. If you want to take a look at this one right here, this is the actual prompt that I'm using. And then I'm also capturing the title. So I'm creating a, the title so that I can identify that capture content of, as to what that journal is about. And this, I'm creating a separate prompt here for that. And here's the prompt I'm using. I'm passing in the speech text variable as the context for this. And then I'm acting as a professional editor with expertise in literary summarization. I'm also getting the date so I can add it and append it as part of the title. So you get that year, month and day format. I think I use AI for this one right here. So I didn't really write any code in this automation. And then I created a node here, add journal to node. I specified the parent page ID, which is the journal that you saw here. So every time this is going to be the parent uh, page and every time I create a new content, I'm just going to be adding a uh, child page within this page. And also I'm concatenating the result of today's date. And then I'm doing the actual text, which is the title and then the content. I'm just shoving it here as the page content and just creating it. Um, this, the next one is for the calendar. I'm extracting the current date so I can specify in the prompt that this is the current date. When you're making a prompt, the date, what the model is trained for is not the current year. So you have to be explicit and specify that, okay, the year in today's date is actually this year. In the future, if it changes or whatever, so it's not going to be using 2021 or some old date or whatever the, the, the model is trained for. And we're going to be using that date and we're just doing a simple output here, returning the actual year right for the current date. And we're going to be feeding it as part of this prompt right here. We're using uh, 3.5 Sonnet again from Claude. And this is the prompt that I'm using. So feel free to pause this video if you want. But essentially, I'm acting as a data ex extraction specialist. And this one is returning a adjacent object containing the properties date and event. The event would be the title of the event and also the date, which contains this specific format. So I'm considering the times offset for uh, Los Angeles, United States. And I'm also adding here to consider the daylight savings time, if there's any. And if the year is not provided, use the year, which is the whatever the current year is. If I explicitly say that I want this event to be created in 2025, this is going to be uh, created in 2025. Otherwise, then it's going to be using the current year as the year to build that date for. So it's going to be smart enough to predict and create the date for whatever the scenario is. If the date does not contain a time, return it in the format within this one. So it doesn't have the, the seconds and the minutes baked in. So instead of the hours, minutes, seconds right here, we're just going to skip that part of it and just going to just return the actual date. So do not include any additional text or explanation. And then the return format is going to be in JSON and it's going to be valid in property uh, structured. And we're going to be feeding it the actual spe speech text variable, which contains the content that we use for the context. So once we get that and uh, once it returns the data, we're going to use this parsing, a JSON parse, which we're going to be feeding in the JSON to turn this JSON string into an actual object that we can use in the automation. 
which then we're going to be adding the Google Calendar event here to create an event. I already specified the connection, which is the existing one. You can add your connection here. And then I'm picking the calendar ID and the event title, which is going to be coming from this JSON right here that the AI has been returned. And then we're specifying the event date and the event end date. So we're specifying the start date and end date to be the same. And we have to make sure that we send an updates to all. This is a required field. You can do an all, external all or none. I just select all. And that's it. If you want to specify a time zone, you can specify that as well. Since I believe that everything is already in there, you don't have to specify that time zone bit. Yeah. So that's pretty much what the automation looks like. So if you like this type of content, please subscribe on my channel. I'll see you guys on the next video.